I'm Rob Lacoury, a senior editor at Gold Derby. I'm here with Glenn Hetrick, prosthetic department head and basically makeup extraordinaire uh, on Star Trek Discovery. And uh, we're here to talk all about his amazing Emmy winning work on the show. First of all, Glenn, congrats on a really strong season three. Every time you think on this show that they couldn't possibly up the ante, we get a season like that. And I firstly was wondering, given that the show has catapulted 900 years into the distant future and you kind of left a lot of the canon from Star Trek in the past. Were you just like really, really excited to explore these new looks that you could then put together and, and, uh, and bring to the audience? Yeah, of course. So um, I'm a lifelong Trekkie. I, I, I love it all. I love TOS. I love next gen. I love DS9. So um just working on the show is is sort of the stream come true experience. And the, the, you're exactly right. In season one and two, because we knew where the arc was going, I started working on the show almost a year before uh, principal, probably eight months or something. So, um, and as we get into season three conversations here today, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of pepper in a few of these cool stories where things that we designed then actually ended up happening now. But exactly like you said, you're a bit hemmed in, right, by canon and that level of expectation. And what it really was from my perspective of being a diehard fan and wanting to make sure that the fans love what we're doing is how do you resolve creating things at the highest technological level that's possible for us today? These silicon makeups that we're doing on this show for characters that work for two episodes used to be reserved for feature film level main villain only and we're pulling them off in weeks how do you get to use that technology but still stay true to the heart of the characters from tos because of where we were in the storyline in one and two so that was this huge challenge and as we figured that out being able to leap forward in season three of course as soon as we saw the scripts we sort of knew towards the end of two what was going on and uh yeah we're just extraordinarily excited to be out in the timeline and continuity being being able to create completely original things that we've not seen before. You know, when you say that you're a lifelong trekking, because I am too, right? And I could not even possibly imagine the excitement of you having to go to work every day and be actually immersed in this world that you looked up to and admired for most of your life. What does that actually feel like? Do you, is it a pinch yourself moment daily? What's it like? Yeah, it, it, it certainly is. And I think um, if the show wasn't what it is, it wouldn't be the same, even though it's Star Trek. So knowing that we were about to work on Star Trek was exciting. But when you finally, when I finally started really working with all Day and the producers on set and you saw how collaborative the process was, it, that, that, that's really what makes it the pinch yourself moment because you're not just, you know, stood there working on a show that you love that has the name of the show it's it's really the very heart of the thing that you love and you're you're being invited in in a collaborative way so the beginning of each season will often start with conversations about are there any um aliens from canon that we've talked about that you really would love to try to find ways to bring them to life and evolve them today so we i get to even pitch ideas of hey as the scripts open up and as we get to scenarios where we might have some delegates or a bar scene um they let me pitch there's a couple couple of characters that were on my my hit list that have made it onto the show <laughs> Beetle Juicy and being one of them who, who really got a, a nice big chunky role this year as Cosmo so uh yeah it's 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 sometimes it's unreal to open up your email and and see an email about Andorians or Orions it's it's almost like you do it every day but it just never wears off there's Every time I see an email with the word Dorian in it, I freak out. You know, same with me. Like every time I know that I'm about to um, uh, witness some more Andorians, I get so excited because I am such an unabashed nerd. Um, and I actually have wondered in the past what was it like to re, not completely redesign them, but revisit them and bring them into a, a more modern age. Can you talk us through the, the nuances? Yeah, um, so that was actually one of the very first things, even though they didn't end up um, where we thought they were, were going to. Season one, um, I, I want to say 
that there is a concept of one of the ship's doctors being an Andorian and that we would live with that. And so that comes with a lot of question marks, you know, because if you go back to TOS and the Andorians that we love from TOS, like you can get away with what they are there and they look awesome. And you don't want them to be so different that they don't feel like they would live in the same world. But today, when you do an Andorian, you immediately go, well, now, are we going to use mechanical elements and actually puppeteer their antenna? Because their ability to emote um, through the makeup, the antenna is a big part of that. Yeah. And, and so are you going to every shot every day of every Andorian have two mechanic puppeteers underneath them and, and limiting your shots to it? Or are they going to be VFX? And if they're going to be VFX, where is that line? We actually underwent a lot of that discussion before uh, season one, episode one. And we didn't end up doing it right then and there, but a lot of that had been figured out. And so ultimately where we landed is their antenna are removable. So we can get lots of shots with the antenna on. And um, then when we want them to emote, we can pull the stalks off and the blend is actually hidden in the scene. So that idea sort of was the impetus behind some of the redesign. We added more anatomy and more wrinkles around the base of the antenna. And then in sort of the tip, we really made that much more sophisticated, like what that was inside of there instead of just an open tube. And then we carried some of those pieces of form language down onto the sides of the face and the neck to make them a little more interesting, but still feel like they could just be a family of endurings we hadn't seen before. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, I can imagine everybody wants to talk to you about the Klingon look, and that's not necessarily obviously season three. We haven't, we didn't get to experience any more Klingons, which upsets me a little. Um, but uh, the redesign of the Klingons was a little controversial for some of the diehard fans, but I, I actually really, really loved the new look. And I, I mean, Mary Chifo playing um, that character was so iconic. What were your thoughts on bringing the Klingons into the into our era? It's sort of exactly what we just talked about. It's the same thing where you want to be as, as true to the form as you can, but also evolve it and make it work as a modern makeup at the highest level that it can. And, and so um, I get the controversy. I, I do, as a fan myself, uh, I had my own conflicting feelings as we went into that process. And But you have to remember, um, I was very much one of those people who hated next-gen Klingons when they showed up. Yeah. Even though we already had them in the film and we had Chris with Deloitte and we had Commander Krug and we, I, I know, but I like my TOS Klingons. And so there was quite a lot of, of that um, a, a unresolved sort of angst about the new look in, in Next Gen. And they really did evolve. You didn't really hear much about it more in DS9. They became more refined, right? So I, I think when Neville was designing them, he had worked on uh, one of the JJ films. And so even though you don't see them a lot, that new look was pretty established the, the idea right and the concept is that you're going back to Roddenberry's vision for what the Klingon were as a predatory species as an, an empirical species and um, sort of the, what's in the, the very DNA of it the reptilian aspect of it and why they have duplicate organs I mean we did deep dives into that stuff to try to find really smart ways to move the design forward that said when everyone saw them involved, I get the reaction, I do. And, and there was a, a lot of talk early on in season one, because none of them had hair, of trying to create some houses that had maybe leather tendrils or something going on on the head that looked like hair. And in fact, when you get into season two and you start to see all of our Klingons with hair, they're not as different, I think, as everybody thought they were. It was just, I think, the shock of seeing them all bald in season one, which ended up having, we talked through this, and uh, me being the geek that I am, I think sometimes they want to just turn the zoom off on me, but um, I kind of, we were at a point where we had done so many bald, and my thing was I wanted each house to have its own look. I wanted each house to have its own cultural patina, because the Klingon having grown up on so many different planets within the Empire would look all very different. Look how different we look on this planet with a few thousand years in us, how different each culture is. And so it kind of went, think about that splayed out across all of these planets and all the environments they live in. It makes sense that the Klingon would all look very different, uh, especially in terms of their hair and their, and, and their clothing and their armor. It didn't have to be this unified look. And that's the first time that that's really been done. And, and we got into it a little bit. 
by the time we were moving into two and we started talking about the possibility of revisiting hair, I, I went back to the uh, the episode where Gowron is fighting with the High Council because they've uh, they've resurrected Kalish and the Klingon's faith is sort of split between is it really him or is it a fraud? And and in fact, he's like a, a DNA clone from the blood of the dagger, right? And so yeah. the high priest asked the story. The, the, the priests of Boreth are the only ones who should know uh, that, that Kalish cut his hair off and, and dipped it in lava and then in the ocean, forging the first batleth. And that's how he unified the empire. And I kind of pitched that as like, so what if that was the reason that they're all, their heads are all shaved? Like, what? we don't have to make a big thing of it, but me as a Klingon nerd, like, that to me would be a cool way of saying the warriors were doing this because the houses weren't unified. And season one was all about the house is yeah. in the fight against the threat of the Federation. And that's the angle we took. It was played as a very small beat in two, but it got us back into being able to do the things that we talked about in one with different hairstyles and beards. So by the time you're in deep in two, there's tons of Klingons with beards and dreads, and, and they really just look like, you know, more highly evolved in terms of technology, the makeup versions of next-gen and DS9 Klingons, hopefully. Hopefully. God, they're so lucky to have someone like yourself who is who really understands Trek and can bring that knowledge and passion into the work. Now, given that you are the head of the department, obviously the cliche is it takes a village. And I can imagine with, with, with Discovery, the makeup, especially prosthetics, is so critical to the look of the show. And over season three, there was so much work done. Can you talk us through the team that you have assembled and how amazing they all are for you guys to be able to get this done so perfectly? Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, it's a massive team. And so we fluctuate from uh, episode to episode. Um, if you kind of watch through season three, there's some episodes that there's, there's almost, I don't think there's any that have no makeup, but some, some of them just have our main characters and maybe a little thing here or there. And then others are visual bounties where we're bringing in two new characters that have never been seen before. And of course, we start all of that months out because we have to create them and get them to Canada and test them. So that's our normal process is that we do um, all of the script breakdown and uh, conceptual discussions months in advance me and a few other departments, even before there are scripts, we sort of get just breakdowns of the main ideas so that we know these aliens are coming. We start discussing the looks and the why and the, and the where and who are they as people and not only what species, but these characters, what are they within their own species? And we start concepting out the designs. We go through many iterations of that. And then we start the sculptures. So the prosthetic characters, the actors that play them are generally cast much far out, further out than a normal actor would be. We get their life cast and we start realizing it in three dimensions. And so Mike O'Brien is the head of our department, sculpts all of these things. And then we actually, it's almost a real-time process. We've got it down so tight now, working in Los Angeles and Toronto, that the producers get to look at uh, the sculptures as we progress and they can go in and make little notes and say, could you make the eye arch a little higher so that this character looks a little more wicked or could you make the ears a bit smaller? So we let them have, th this process allows them to have th that level of, of integration into the art. So then we, of course, get an approved sculpt, we mold, but then hundreds of copies of these things, depending on the makeup, sometimes it's 10, sometimes Saru, I think we're in a couple of hundred times, they all have to be run in silicon. So Ken Culver and his entire department of silicon uh, fabricators, they do all that, seam it all up. And then uh, um, Jamie Grove and a team of painters have to paint and you have to keep the paint exactly the same every day, no matter how many yeah. times it's done, right? Which in and of itself is a thing. And then we get it all up to Canada. So it has to go through shipping. It has to arrive on set. And then the team on set in Canada, which is read, led in season three by Mike Smith and his department head, um, they sort of unpack everything, start figuring it out. We send lots of videos back and forth. And then they do a lot of testing in Toronto. So they'll bring the actors in and they'll actually do physical makeup tests in the trailer on set, get the producer's feedback from that. And at that point, we're usually a week to two from uh, shooting. So we can make any last minute changes to color or, or adapt anything we have to. And then we go into our shooting schedule. So that's basically the process. So in shop, you know, um, Myself, my wife, Michelle, and Matt Mullen, who's our shop supervisor, run a crew of between 40 and 80 people. 
depending. And a lot of times it's 24 hours a day split shifts. And then in Toronto, Mike's running a trailer, um, just prosthetic department. The amazing makeup team is completely separate on the machine. Yeah. It's so big, right? So Mike's team can fluctuate of American Canadians between um, five or six people and can go up to 20 or 30 when they have a lot of Vulcans or Romulans and uh, background characters, it, it gets massive. That's incredible. Like Trek has always been so acclaimed for its production value and discovery is absolutely no exception and to be and and you know in the past treks won lots of emmys uh usually for makeup visual effects and things like that and speaking of emmys i think six nominations so far for this amazing show for two seasons you're the you and your team are the only ones who have taken home an emmy so far and that was for that really awesome um throwback episode of memory serves the starring Melissa George and um, brought us all back to TOS days. So talk us through winning an Emmy. Like you're the first, you're the first from this show to have to take one home. It's, it's crazy. Um, and I'm sure that the, the other team members will eventually get theirs too. It's a matter of time. The show is just so, I've worked in so many television shows and so many films and they're usually very different things. And this show is, you know, you're, you're making a major motion picture every episode every every two episodes is essentially the same amount of footage as a feature film and there's not a whole lot of places where we're doing anything smaller than an absolutely massive budget feature film so certainly not in our department we're doing more makeup on an episode or two a trek than we do on most huge films right um but yeah i mean we were very fortunate to uh especially the year that we won the, the competition that we had was was just absurd how difficult it was and um when, when you're up against Game of Thrones, you know, it's like, yeah. you got to bring it or you don't, you don't have a prayer. And like, we, we love all of the work that Barry and his team does on that show. Um, and we're all big fans of one another, right? So I I don't, I can't speak to other departments or, or parts of the industry, but when the effects teams get together, we're all just so happy to be at the Emmys. We're so busy geeking out over everybody else's work that's there. And then you, the moment comes and, you just, you, I don't think you ever really think it's going to be you until it is. And then you get up there and uh, I've been on a lot of stages in my life and that's probably, that was one of the scariest, you know, there's, there's not a lot of footlights. You can see the whole audience and it's a big audience and, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing. It's breathtaking. It is breathtaking. And you're representing this show and you're right. You did beat Game of Thrones. That was, I, I remember I was very, one of the very few people who were like, no, 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 no. I think Discovery is going to win that one. And I was so grateful that I was right. Um, I always, when I up speak to makeup and hair designers generally, I generally like to talk about some of the challenges that you face day to day. I would imagine apart from having to get up at the crack of dawn, you're there before everybody else. You're, you're there to set the scene and, you know, it takes hours to get the prosthetics done right plus throughout the day, continuity and touch-ups and so forth. But I was also thinking, especially with your work, you have nowhere to hide. Like we sometimes are looking at Saru in close-up and it has to look seamless and perfect. Otherwise, I'm out of the story and I know that it's just fake. So I was wondering how difficult it is to get someone, for example, like Saru, perfect all the time throughout the whole shoot. It, it, extraordinarily and and um another thing a lot in season three is uh something is what seemingly simple elusively simple as an orion um yeah i don't know that everyone knows the orions are covered in silicon because the show we wanted them to feel alien we wanted to make sure they weren't people painted green everything we do now because of hd it's we're beyond that you can't get away with it has to be better so even though there's not a lot of form to their makeups the Orions are all silicon. And so the paint, so, so going back to like a Saru, first thing I want to say is at this point in my career, working on multiple shows, I really don't do set days. In season one, I went up during the top of the show and got everything established, put the team up. So we did the first episode. I went back once. Um, and then in season two, I got to play a Klingon. Other than that, thankfully, I'm not doing what you just said, but the team is. So Mike and Chris and Hugo and Nicola, everyone that's up there, they're, they're doing like, you know, a lot of days, their calls are 2, 30, 3 o'clock in the morning in order to get everybody ready uh, for camera. And so, yeah, there's just the duration of it. It's like a marathon, you know, and you got to be able to do that every week for months on end. And they do it flawlessly with characters like Saru that you're going to do a lot of them. 
there's actually the added level of difficulty. It's, it's very astute what you're saying. There, you, there can't be variation. So one of the ways we control that, and one of the ways we make the show, shows like this possible at Alchemy, is we really focused on, after all these years of bouncing around from when I was on Buffy and Angel and X-Files, and then like working on stuff like Blade 2 for XFX, you started to learn the silicon techniques, and you started to look at things that were taking six months or a year to get to screen. And how can you get that down to a month? How can you get down to maybe three weeks? So Star Trek definitely, when this show came along, it was the right time, the right place, and we were the right shop to take all those processes, as truncated as you can make them, and instead of going, you can have that in six months, we, we, we can get that to you, and we can do it in a way that it works in a television show. And the difference is, in a film, you could spend six hours putting someone in makeup, because the days that the makeup shoots, it's about the makeup. So the day is blocked around the makeup. The lights are, are blocked around the makeup. The actual blocking and the acting is, is around the makeup. TV's not like that. They, the pieces go on and they go into a scene that sometimes you're shot into. And so you have to work with existing lighting conditions, existing blocking, and you can't spend six hours, right? So they, unbelievably, the application team has gotten uh, Doug's makeup down to under two hours, sometimes as, as low as an hour and a half. Wow. Uh, full makeup. So we go as far as we can in shop, getting as far down to like 90% finish. Um, we've made gloves for Doug so he doesn't have to get glued in every day. Uh, which is a great trick for saving about an hour and a half that we're just slipping gloves on. But for each character, it's different. You got to find all these little ways um, to, to, to keep the continuity, keep the time and the application down and keep it perfect every day. And it takes a lot. I mean, you're kind of always finding new tricks to make it a little bit better, the process. Wow. I think Doug Jones must be so grateful for that because I'm sure as thrilled as they are to play the characters, that must get tiring after a while to have to sit in the chair all that time. But yeah. He's a saint. He's a saint. I've worked with him so many times over yeah. the course of my career and think, um, yeah. we heavily championed for him uh, to be considered when we were working on, on the first script before everyone was there because we knew he could he could kill it and bring it to life. And and in fact, there was a first iteration of Saru that was more like um, a giant flying V head covered in eyes. And uh, it would have been heavily heavy VFX every episode. I mean, it looks nothing like the Saru we know. Yeah. And um, we really, and I hope someday we use that anyway. We built it on Doug and everything did VFX test, but I really wanted this because it's very, very small. It's very tight to Doug's face. Yeah. And it allows you to get Doug Jones, the performer, through that makeup. And, and that's really, I think, why Saru is such a successful character. It's a, it's a perfect blend of prosthetics and, uh, and, and enabling the incredible performer that's wearing them to yeah. do what he does. Yeah, absolutely. And by the way, I'm glad you brought up the Orions because I think season three, one of the highlights was the Orions, particularly Osira, played by Margot Kidder, who are, sorry, not Margot, Janet Kidder, who I'm still, um, you know, pining over because I missed that character. But yeah, that work on the Orions was so interesting. Like it wasn't just green makeup. There was so much more going on there. So yes, congratulations on that one. Too. She was, um, again, probably deceptively difficult. You know, it's, it's deceptively simple. It's very difficult. And uh, she played over a course of several episodes, as you know, in her arc. And we continued to rework that makeup to just make it a little bit better with uh, every application. We ended up sculpting a new chin and lip for her as we went just to get it so that the application went more smoothly, a little bit more quickly. And they're, they're very difficult makeups, those Orions, uh, to get them so uh, smooth um, because... It's a strange thing, right? Like if, if you're talking to me, Robert, your face wrinkles. I don't yeah. look at your face at all. Your face is wrinkling. We just know that our face is wrinkled. But yeah. as soon as you put this beautiful translucent silicon and this, these emerald greens and you get that alien look, when someone's moving, any of our creatures, you start to really notice when the makeup is wrinkling. And so the, the, trying to, to figure out all the exact depths and thicknesses and the frequency of the the, as the actor moves his or her muscles through the prosthetic, trying to control that frequency so it translates perfectly for screen, it's a it's a process. And on film, you used to you know have a year to figure it out, and we're and we're jamming through that in a couple of weeks on, on these shows. And so um, she was an incredibly successful character, and and wow, what a what a performance! I know, right, mate. 
thank you so much for your time today. What a pleasure to talk about stuff like this. I've, I've been geeking up for 20 minutes. So it was a real pleasure and congratulations on a super strong season three. Thank you so much. You can call me anytime and we'll continue to geek out about Star Trek. I love it. Yes. Thank you.